It all comes down to June 22nd. What's OPEC going to do? How much are they going to increase production and when? I, I hate to say this, but I think it's already been done. I mean, you in many ways, right now? yeah, no, I think the, that the announcement between the Russians and the Saudis was the June 22nd meeting. The only thing that can come now out of the June 22nd meeting is actually bullish for the market because all they have to do is cut less than a million barrels a day, which is what was in the statement that they were going to cut as much as a million barrels a day. And I think that is that's really what caused the market to drop six bucks. And, and I think that hmm. that's the limitation on on what that million barrels means. Now, take a look. You have um, 600,000 barrels that's not coming out of Venezuela and likely another half million barrels uh, will be added to that by the time the year is up in Venezuela. They're really in trouble. Uh, new sanctions in Iran uh, targets a million two barrels a day, but you know, likely with Europe not going along and, and Asia not going along with new sanctions, maybe they'll cut 300,000 barrels from, from Iranian production. That's a million barrels a day. I mean, right there you get to the place where we were in terms of 100% compliance. Um, with the OPEC production guidelines. And since we're over complying, you just we're have to get down to regular the last compliance. Couple months. And the only thing that would be bullet, uh, uh, bullish if you, if you get under um, 1 million barrels a day, that means it's bullish. Yeah, because this huh. is what's been expected now. Now that we've put that million barrels of a day of an increase into the, uh, you know, into the marketplace, that's what everybody's talking about. How much of that million barrels a day that's being promised. Now, the Russians will want all of it for themselves sure. because they have no uh, loyalty to OPEC or the global uh, supply chain, um, but uh, the Saudis—they're you know—they're pushing a little bit of a, of a tightrope because they're trying to get their IPO there. They need a, a higher oil price. They've promised you know President Trump a little bit of a lower price for uh, putting back sanctions on the Iranians. So they're they're on a bit of a tightrope here. Let's see what they and, do. And all of this has had real implications on uh, many spreads. But one that I'll point out is the one between Brent and WTI. Uh, Ten dollars a barrel now it was eleven last week. Uh, Dan. Why the recent surge? I mean, you can tell me this is all about the Permian, or is this something else going it on? It is. There's, there's an infrastructure problem here. I mean, you saw what happened in Canada, and I thought this was a really interesting story about Trudeau buying the Kinder Morgan pipeline going to uh, the west from oil sands going towards the Pacific. And the reason that the Canadian government needs to go in and buy pipelines is because pipelines has become a very difficult business to monetize. It takes a very long time. You're not sure how long that supply is going to last, that you're really going to get money back to shareholders. Now, this is what's happening in the Permian. Huge ramp up in production and they're all waiting for infrastructure to get all of this and the associated gas out. And that's been the big problem. That's what's been killing the spreads here. And it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon because those pipelines into West Texas are not coming along so fast. Again, for the same reasons as the, uh, the Canadians had to get involved. It's really unsure whether you know, pipeline builders are going to get a good return back for the amount of money they're spending putting those pipelines in. Okay, Burns, take us into the world of the investor. As you're invest, uh, making investments, how do you take into account things like the price of oil, long-term price of oil, also the difficulty with the pipelines? Well, if, uh, from, a, from an investor's perspective, and we're, we're looking at the oil um, stocks, the equities, I think one of the, the, the key factors to focus on is that where, as oil prices have run up over the past year, the stocks have been largely left behind. Last year, they, they certainly lagged by a wide margin. And you have a lot of players there that you know, really could, could, could be profitable at this point. They've been a, a lot more disciplined with their capital spending, a lot more disciplined. They've, they've cut costs. And so you know, they could be profitable at oil prices far below where they are today. And you know, within the energy space, I think, in fact, one of the themes that's you know, continued to work very well this year has been uh, a group of names that you know, they, they referred to in the press as the pledgers, you know, companies that have pledged cost discipline, pledged capital discipline, um, and a focus on their dividends. Um, um, and that's really probably been one of the best ways to play it so far this year. So, Burns, you like big oil? I think some of the big oils look very attractive. Royal Dutch Shell is one that, if you look at it, it takes uh, at a discount yeah. to Exxon. Um, it's it's cheaper in terms of price to earnings. Uh, the price to book is um, at a reasonable level. They have a higher dividend yield than you say would pay uh, get for Exxon. And again, they're one of the names that they've um, continued to focus on 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 keeping costs low. And and in fact, they're yeah. one that specifically benefits from making a large contrarian acquisition back at the the, the trough of oil price prices. So they look interesting. Conoco does. Chevron does as well.
Uh, Dan, how are you playing it? He mentioned Conoco, and Ryan Land said last week he might actually stop investing in the Permian if that Midland Houston discount continues to blow out. What's the best play for well, you? Well, we, we already have at the Energy World. We've been out of the Permian for several months now, seeing these spreads uh, blow. And, and now what you need to find is you need to find those maybe more um, uh, mature shale players in the Bakken, in the Eagleford, and f trying to find those that haven't hedged all of their production for 2018 going forward, because mm. those are the ones that are going to be able to take advantage of this higher price of oil. Many of the shale players hedged a lot of their production, you know, in the 50s and in the low 60s, and now with oil prices above that, they're not going to be able to take advantage of that big run. So one name that just uh, jumps out at you as someone who never hedges and, and really rolls the bones is Harold Hamm's mm -hmm. Continental. Okay. So I think that's, that's, that's a, a very easy play to make right now.